Welcome to Fireside Chats, a series of curated virtual conversations as part of the Data Values Project. My name is Karen Bett and I'm part of the Data Values Project team at the Global Partnership. Today I'll be chatting with Al Katz, the founder of the Open Institute, an African organization that works with governments and civil society organizations to promote open government and citizen engagement. We're excited to have Al join us to reflect on the work of Open Institute and Data Ready on Restore Data Rights, focusing on the trends at the nexus of the data revolution and digital rights in Africa. Al, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Right, so we'll get straight to the questions and I'll, uh, I have about five questions for you, Al. Um, I think just starting from the basics, can you pinpoint the event or the circumstance that made you realize that data rights in Africa was off the map or did not exist, and hence the need to have this project on restore data rights. I have many, many stories I could tell you. Um, in Kenya, we have, um, every time we enter a building, there's a, there's a book that we must write our names, our IDs, and, and um, other details on. It's called, I call it the book of truth. Um, I call it the book of truth because um, those of us who are aware never write the truth. Um, we write a fake number and write a, um, a fake ID number and so on. But when you think about it, for a lot of buildings, we have to go and write down our actual names, our actual ID numbers and stuff like that. And I've always wondered what happens to that data because a lot of that data just disappears or um, it, it, may, it may explain how we found ourselves as uh, members of political parties that we did not intend ourselves to be in because that's what happened in Kenya um, the year before last. Then the other thing that I think I remember is the fact that telcos in Kenya, for example, collect um, biometric data even. They collect our data, um, our pictures and so on, so that they can be able to, and in fact, uh, Safaricom now collects even our voice so that they can be able to use it to identify us. But then that same um, telco has announced recently that they are going to um, sell our aggregate uh, customer data um, to other sources. And we have no right to refuse really. Our right, of, our right of refusal is that we stop using um, the telco that you have used for the last 20 years, which is very difficult for most people, especially because now our telecommunications is tied to our money, is tied to so many other things. And then finally, is the during the COVID, uh, when COVID came, um, governments had to do this thing called um, contact tracing. And when you think about contact tracing, um, they needed to figure out who, where I was, who I was next to, and how do they tell them? And that means they, they needed to track my phone. What if I didn't want them to know where, you know, where, where I was? What if I didn't want anyone to know where I was? Um, and I saw recently somebody commenting and saying, how come, you know, as, as now things are getting more opened up, we are needing to show an Ascari our health status. Um, how is that going to be handled? So when you think about those sort of situations, when you think about the fact that many Kenyans are getting unwanted SMSs, because their numbers have been um, given um, to unscrupulous characters who want to sell them things. All of these things um, create a certain problem that I that caused me to want to act. Thanks, Al. And I think uh, just picking on your last point on wanting to act, tell us maybe very briefly, what did you do uh, with the Restore Data Rights? And yeah, tell us about the activities that you did and sort of the work that you did and obviously what you achieved with that? So um, Tom Morell and I got talking um, around that time and it, it was initially just mm -hmm. pontificating about the issues of what was happening around COVID both here and in the UK. And um, one of the things that we sort of zeroed in on was the whole question of contact tracing and so on. And we decided let's call people together and let's have a conversation. So we had a our first um, meeting um, where we brought in people of all walks of life from different parts of Africa and just said, so um, what uh, we understand that there's an emergency and the governments must use um, people's data as they will. But because we were assuming that um, COVID will be over in just a few months, 
um, we said, well, what happens after um, COVID? Um, when, co when there is no emergency, what is a signal that we have that there's no more emergency and therefore people's right, rights must be restored? The governments must no longer be able to uh, do contact tracing because contact tracing is something that can be used for other things like finding dissidents um, and, and finding people who, who are not uh, popular with the government. So what, what is this thing that must, must be done to say that now there's no emergency and then people must have their rights back? Um, so when we, when we finally agreed with that is that what we did is that we brought a number of organizations together um, and together we drafted something called the um, Restored Data Rights Declaration, which was a declaration by civil society organizations that was meant to also be signed by many other Africans. In fact, it was signed by many, many Africans um, and which was meant to go almost as a petition to Pan-African organizations like the African Union, like ECOWAS, like the East African community, and get them to begin to think about how do they build uh, structures and laws that protect our rights as citizens at a Pan-African level, but also at national level. Um, this conversation is still ongoing um, as, as, um, as it has been going for the last couple of years. Um, and we are excited that, um, you know, um, whereas for us, we are figuring out that movement building is not an easy thing, but we are happy to see that it is plodding along and it is trying to um, gain as much traction, especially among government uh, officials. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And I completely agree with you about movement building it takes, it takes another movement or it takes time. So, you know, that's really strong lessons. There's also something that you mentioned, uh, which I sort of held on to when I read uh, your publications that actually it's not about restoring uh, rights, it's now building rights because, you know, we are in the normal, the new normal. It's no longer, yeah. uh, you know, a post-COVID um, phase. And so my next question is, you know, what issues remain unsolved and resolved? I know you've touched on movement building takes time, but you know, what's unresolved when it comes to data rights in Africa? And as you unpack that question, what needs to change and who needs to act? Well, you see, the reason we change to restore from restore data rights to build data rights is because we realize that the assumption that we had that COVID was going to end in a few months, of course, is not gonna pan out to be true. And uh, this is something that we're gonna stay with for a long time. Um, some of the more progressive Africans already have their booster shots, which is their third shot. Um, and there's conversations of us needing to get even another shot in another six months and so on and so forth. So it looks like this is something that we may, we may need to continue to live with for a long time. If that is the case, um, then we must come back to uh, brass tacks and say that there's a number of things that we must deal with. We are still not agreed on how sensitive personal data must be handled in this in this continent. We have um, different countries having different levels of policy making um, sort of status um, on on issues of privacy and sensitive personal data. Um, we have different structures. So you find that in Mauritius, the office of the data protection commissioner um, sits in the office of the prime minister. In Kenya, it is uh, a pseudo independent um, office that is supposed to be independent, but that is somehow still sitting in the office of the um, ICT ministry. Um, and in South Africa, it is a pseudo, um, you know, independent. So you're finding that in different places, uh, there is no absolute independence for that office. And there isn't absolute independence laws and structures that are enforced to protect citizen rights. So this is the thing that we must resolve. Who must act on this? Civil society must really come together and they must really drive the advocacy of this particular issue. Um, citizen groups must come and join the civil society organization. But most importantly, parliamentarians and government officials, they need to come together and they need to agree that um, for us to grow, for us to grow into the world of virtual reality and augmented reality and being able to transact 
um, virtually and so on and so forth. For us to be able to have a, a shilling, the, the, the Central Bank of Kenya recently announced that we want to have a digital shilling. For us to have all of these things and to participate fully into that world, for us to be able to take true advantage of the Africa continental free trade area where digital payments are now um, accepted and these regulations around us being able to trade as Africans, for all of this to happen within the continent, then personal, sensitive personal data and how privacy is handled must be dealt with. So there's, there's something for all of us to, to sort of get our teeth onto um, and, and you know, sort of get ourselves focused on. And finally, there's the question of um, citizens. Last year, we did a, a citizen campaign where we reached about 5 million um, Kenyans and East Africans. And we were essentially just trying to drive awareness around the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And we were trying to drive awareness of um, what uh, data protection is. What was interesting to us is that we learned that um, majority of, of, um, of Kenyans don't know what um, data is. Data for them is bundles that you buy on the phone. When we talk about things like cookies, cookies are biscuits. So they don't really understand how these things, how the fact that when I talk about um, iPad, 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 iPad in the, in the, in the, in the uh, vicinity of my phone, then Facebook is gonna start showing me iPads to buy or lawnmowers or you know, whatever it is. And it, it's, it, it doesn't tell you exactly how it is that our you know, geographical data and so on is gonna be handled. So these are things that we must get our citizens to be aware of, and then we must act to make sure that there are structures to protect us. Just speaking on that point, actually, on getting citizens to, uh, to be aware and to act, I know um, citizens take action when they care about an issue. You know, you'd give the example of uh, when money is not uh, spent well, for example, or when there's, uh, you know, something that happens out there which is not maybe sensitive to uh, specific genders, then you'd seen an outcry of, uh, of citizens. And I think that is usually where you see real change. So I ask myself, how do we get citizens to really care about privacy, about protection, about these issues that you were tackling in the uh, Restore Data Rights uh, project? So, you know, getting citizens to care about, about a particular thing means that we have to break it all the way down to um, a certain level of understanding. And the most importantly, we have to get them to a place where um, it almost makes um, dollar sense or shilling sense um, to their, their lives. So if you, if you come um, here in Kilifi and you meet um, Mama Furaha who has, uh, he, she has a phone and it's a smartphone and she has Facebook on it, uh, but she only ever uses that Facebook to post a picture or to see what her friends are doing and so on and so forth. If you tell her that she needs to protect her own rights where that is concerned, then you know, you're not really saying anything. Worse yet is that if you're speaking to Mama Furaha and she does not have an ID card for herself and you're trying to tell her that um, you know, writing um, her details on the book of truth is something that is detrimental to her, again, she doesn't really care because of the fact that it doesn't really affect her. So we have to bring the issue of, of data governance to a place where um, it is not an elitist issue. Um, currently, if you go to any discussion around um, data governance, you find that it is, it is generally elitist. It is uh, you and I, um, Karen, uh, who are data scientists, so to speak, who might be discussing issues of data governance and so on. You're not having even people who are educated, but who are not within the ICT or data space having real conversations about um, data governance and, and the protection of, of, of um, people's rights. I'd like to see a couple of things happen um, to be able to create um, a good and strong structure for this. One, I'd like to see that there are laws that are enforced, that are strengthened, um, that protect um, citizens from the misuse of their data by anyone, whether it is government, whether it is business and so on. 
I like a situation where citizens know and use their right to choose how their data is, um, is handled. I like a situation where um, government and businesses have a healthy, maybe the word I should use is respect, but the word I really want to use is fear, that they have a healthy fear of how they handle people's data and the liberties that they can take with that data. And finally, I want to see a world where you have the ODPC, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, you have the courts that are empowered, that are independent enough to be able to protect citizens from the misuse of, of data, that those four structures um, are strongly in place and that mm. they are strongly enforced. I think that if, if, if for example, I, I have um, a situation where I have these loan companies that keep sending me um, messages, I think if one day I have the courage to actually take them to court and I would win that case um, and they would have to pay me um, damages, then businesses then develop that jurisprudence that says that if you misuse people's data, then there's, there's, um, there's an impact um, to you. Even if it is a declaration by court that they have done something wrong, then there's something to, to be done. So I think th that's what I would say in terms of what I'd like to see um, and what I'd like us to build on um, as we build um, data rights. Great, and I think you've, you've really touched on the point uh, which was going to go to like uh, the ideal world for you on data and digital rights. Um, Al, I wonder if you have any final thoughts on this topic and actually reflecting on things that you want the restore data rights to move to or the bill data rights to move to as you advanced on the topic? I think the biggest thing that I would do is that I would call on, especially African civil society organizations and African professionals, we need you. We need your participation. We need your friendship. We need your, um, we need a little bit of your time. Um, we don't need too much time. We'll do, Tom and I will do all the heavy lifting, but we didn't need your presence because of the fact that at this point in time, this is the junction that we are at where we need to make as much noise and we need to push as hard as possible to make sure that um, structures are put in place to protect citizens' rights where data is concerned. This requires voices. This requires people who can write. This requires people to sign that declaration. Please go to restoredatarights.africa and find that declaration and put your name against it. Please help us to get um, in front of the African Union, in front of um, SADC, in front of ECOWAS and so on. And let's um, have those engagements at those levels. Let's get our governments um, to become a lot more aware um, of what they need to do. Put us in front of your parliamentarians and we'll make the case for them to actually have a law that protects um, data rights. We are looking for partners now. We want to work with you, so please reach out. Great, thanks so much, Al. Um, I think that was a really powerful and like we need everybody's voices uh, for, this, uh, for this movement to be successful. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Al. This has been a Data Values Project Fireside Chat. You can follow the conversation online at hashtag data values and subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up with new Fireside Chats as they're released. Thank you so much and thank you once again, Al. Thank you for, for having me.